Welcome to Worship Saints. Glad to see you tonight. Glad that you could join us for worship, whether you are here or you are joining us later on online. Um, if you need the bulletin, it is available on our website. Um, and also, just wanted to let you know, if you hadn't seen it yet, the annual report, the video um, annual report for 2020 is up on our website now too. So you can go there and check that out and see what we've been up to. Um, I don't have a lot of announcements today. We have communion during this service. We'll be celebrating the sacrament together here. And if you are online today, uh, you can celebrate at home using your own elements that you have there. Um, are there any other announcements or prayer concerns? All right, let us turn our hearts to God. Call to worship. It is good to sing praises to our God. God is gracious, and a song of praise is fitting. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God with the lyre. Let us worship God.
God, you are glorious, you are majestic, you are powerful, you are good, you are so far beyond us. High above us, your righteousness reigns. And yet, down in the midst of where we are, in the muck of our daily lives, you are here too. We thank you, O oh God, for being ever present to us, for knowing us, for caring for us, loving us, and leading us. Help us to turn our hearts and our minds and our souls fully to you as we worship this day. Amen. Now, friends, as we come into God's presence, we know that we're carrying things that are going to get in the way. We are carrying sin and guilt and shame. We are, we are carrying the effects of those bad decisions that we may have made. And if we lay them before God, God is faithful, God is just, and we know that God will meet us here. So let us turn to God in confession now. Lord God, you know our brokenness. You heal the afflicted. Save us from sin when we inflict pain on our neighbors. We bear grudges against those who deceive us. We seek revenge on those who hurt us. Some we judge inferior since they don't meet our standards. Others we deem unworthy of our respect and support. In Jesus, you showed compassion on all who are downtrodden. Forgive us, O oh God, when our hearts are hardened against neighbors in need. Christ, the old has gone, the new has come. In Jesus Christ, you are a new creation. Thanks be to God for this new day, for the forgiveness and mercy that God offers. The peace of Christ be with you. Now share that peace with one another. As we come back together, let us affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'll invite Dallas to come up and lead us in our reading now. The rest of you may be seated. Let us turn now to the reading of God's word as we prepare to listen to the scripture. Please join me in the prayer for illumination found in your bulletin. Lord of all wisdom, help us to hear your word read and proclaimed today. Voice of truth, lead us in the way you would have us go and correct any error in us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is from Isaiah 
chapter 40, verses 21 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits upon above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in. Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows upon them and they wither. And the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings them out, their host and numbers them, calling them all by name because he is great in strength, might in power, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. We continue in Mark tonight, um, or, or this morning. Don't tell anyone. Shh. Um, we continue in Mark as we've been reading the Gospel of Mark. Um, and in this couple of verses, we're going to see Jesus hard at work. I invite you to listen now for God's word. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let's go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I remember uh, several years ago, uh, one night I was at um, my friend Bill's wedding rehearsal. Uh, after it had ended, uh, we were riding home, uh, riding back to his apartment, and his roommate was driving. 
And uh, this was in Seattle. It was a good thing he, his roommate was driving because I didn't know the town. I didn't know my way around anywhere. Um, but his roommate was driving, and for some reason that I couldn't ever fully understand, he was in a terrible hurry. He, he was just flooring it. He was, you know, pedal to the metal, uh, stomping on the gas, stomping on the brake, every intersection. You know, we were just speeding through as fast as we could. And, uh, and it just kept getting faster and faster and faster. And I kept getting more and more uncomfortable. And I was kind of just sitting there hoping we would hit red lights so we could slow down. Finally, I just had to shout, hey, hey, what's the hurry, man? Slow down. You know, in Mark's gospel, when you get in the car with Jesus, you're going to feel the same kind of thing. There's this sense that once, once we cast in, you know, we, we cast in our lots with Jesus, that we've got to buckle up and hold on tight because he is moving and he is not going to slow down. You might have caught some of that sense from the reading today from Mark. Uh, in just 10 short verses, we, we ran through four different scenes. Simon Peter's mother-in-law at home, and then Jesus healing the crowds at Capernaum, and then Jesus praying before dawn the next day, and then the crew of disciples moving out and, and heading back onto the road to continue their mission, their, their journey, uh, bringing the good news to others. As they arrived in Simon Peter's house, they, they found his mother-in-law sick with a fever. And maybe our first reaction is, oh no, a little fever, so what? But we have to remember in the ancient world, a little fever is not a so what. It's, it's a big deal. A little fever might be enough to do you in. There are no vaccines back then. There, there's, this is no take two Tylenol, call me in the morning kind of situation. A little fever could be a matter of life and death. And so Peter's mother-in-law, we have to understand, has really been laid low here, and she genuinely might not recover. She is trapped by this fever. And so Jesus comes in, he takes her by the hand, he raises her up, and he makes her well. And, you know, the, the ancient Hebrews may not have had all of our medical understanding that we have today, but they did understand social distancing. They understood uh, communicable diseases. And they had some, actually some pretty smart and, and specific rules for avoiding infection. Going into a sick person's room, no. Sitting on their bed, uh-uh. And taking them by the hand, absolutely not. These are all violations of quarantine. We, we get that now. We know how, how you shouldn't be doing that, but Jesus did. None of that stopped Jesus. He went into her room. He, he came close to her. He raised her up. He took her by the hand. And when he raised her up, uh, the word Mark uses is significant. It's krateo. And that's the same word that will be used to describe what happens to Jesus after three days in the tomb when he is raised up. So there's a hint of the resurrection story. It's almost a, a foreshadowing or a, you know, pay attention. Life is being restored here. And that really helps me make sense of what happens next. Because the text says that this woman gets up and starts serving them. And if you read it in one way, that's kind of problematic. That sounds pretty chauvinistic. You know, here she is at death's door, and, and Simon and his buddies come barging in, and Jesus heals her, and, and, and they send her back to the kitchen to start making them snacks. Well, that's not really what I think happened. To me, this text has more of a sense of liberation. When Jesus heals her, Peter's mother-in-law is set free from her illness, set free from the threat of death, and she chooses to respond in service. It's like, you, do you know anybody who has the gift of hospitality? You know, somebody who just loves to take care of people when they come to visit? Who maybe even feels compelled to, to kind of roll out the welcome wagon? They just can't help themselves. You know, that can be a genuine vocation for some people, and I get the feeling that the mother-in-law was one of these people. To be sick, invalid, unable to welcome the guests who come into your home and to care for them would pain her very soul. 
And so making her well again would necessarily include her regaining the ability to do what she loves to do, to, to take care of others, to serve others. And so that's what happens when Jesus heals her. And I love this. The Greek word for what she does is diakone. Now, do you hear in that the, the same root as our officer word, deacon? There's an argument to be made in Mark's gospel that this is the first of Jesus' real disciples. Because she's the first one who actually acts like it, who actually seems to get it. You know, the four brothers heard Jesus call at the lakeshore, and they came along with him. They dropped their nets and went with Jesus. But Simon's mother-in-law is the first person in the gospel to really follow Jesus by mimicking his actions, by doing what she sees him doing. He shows up healing, casting out demons, serving others. And when she experiences his freedom, she does the same. It is his healing touch in her life that frees her from what had kept her trapped, that fever, and allows her, enables her, to live according to his example. And maybe that makes us stop and consider, what has Jesus freed us from? And what might he want us to do with that freedom? Well, later that evening, people start flocking to Jesus looking for freedom from their own illnesses and afflictions. And it's not easy to keep good news a secret. There's a man staying just down the street at Simon's place who can make you whole again, who can make you well again. And well, people who value that kind of freedom are going to go and do what they can to uh, yeah, at least have a chance to check it out. You know, when you have something that people want, they will make an effort to find you. I remember the story of one megachurch uh, back from its uh, beginning, its, its founding days, when it was just starting out in a forefront. The, the couple of uh, pastors who were trying to get this church together were sitting around thinking about how they were going to advertise. What was their signage going to look like? How are they going to attract people? How are people going to find them? And one of them came up with the utterly illogical idea that they should have no sign. They should have no name. They should be just like the trendy bars and clubs in their cities that didn't have signs and didn't have names and you couldn't even find them. You didn't even know about them unless somebody invited you to them. They wanted to generate that same sense of mystique, that sense that you really had to want to go to this church in order to get there. And while that might have been a little bit of a gimmicky way to go about it, I think it's not all the way off base. When you have something people want, they will make the effort to find you. That was true about Jesus. At our best, it has been true about Christians, too. In the early days of the church, the Acts era, and immediately after that, Christian communities were radically different from the surrounding culture. They cut across all ethnic and economic barriers. You would see Romans and Jews together. You would see men and women together. You would see officials and farmers and philosophers and soldiers and blue-collar workers all mixed together in a Christian house church because they didn't see themselves as different. They didn't allow those things to define them. They allowed their allegiance to Jesus to define them. And so they were bound together in these shared faith communities where they cared for one another. They, they sold their own goods and they contributed proceeds to the overall needs of the group. The communion meal that we're going to share later in this service was something they practiced too. Although when they shared it, it was a full meal. They all sat down together at a table and they ate together. People from all different walks of life became equal. They became the same. All the distinctions melted away. And this commitment to radical equality and communal care once set the church apart. It was one of the reasons that people wanted to become Christian. Not so long ago in, in this country's own history, the church was the driving force in education. 
Methodists and Lutherans and Anglicans and Catholics and Presbyterians were all responsible for establishing hundreds of colleges and universities across the nation for promoting literacy and vocational learning among the population. Groundbreaking medical research was done in hospitals and facilities that were funded and run by Christians. Orphanages and children's homes were staffed and supported by churches and their members. Are we still doing these things? Are we still offering the world anything unique or valuable? Are we still living in visibly different ways that attract attention? There are still crowds of sick and afflicted people all around us. There are still racial and economic inequalities. There are still broken men and women wrestling with their own demons. And a lot of the time, they're not flocking to us for hope. These days, it seems they're turning to miracle drugs and stock market bubbles and internet conspiracy theories. And is that because we don't have anything to offer them? Is it because we don't have anything of value to share with them? Or is it because we've just kind of forgotten how to do it? We who are here every week, who know what's so good about the relationship we have with Jesus, sometimes seem to forget that that's not so obvious to everyone else. There are people out there who still need to hear the good news from us. And I know you're thinking, you know, everybody I know has already heard about Jesus. They're already familiar with the cross and Christianity. And fair enough, they probably are. But have they ever seen it lived in a way that really made a difference? That really enabled them to understand what was so good about the good news? Or has it just been presented to them as a set of rules, another set of obligations, moral obligations that you have to fulfill because we said so. And you know, you, you probably don't want to get on the, on the wrong side of the big guy. If the perception is that the church is only about making your life harder without making it any better, I can understand why people aren't interested. Let's think more about how our faith is good news and how it can actually improve people's lives in the here and now. Now back in Mark, following that evening full of healings, Jesus goes off to a deserted place to pray in the early morning. And the disciples come looking for him again, knowing that he has something they need. They report that the whole village is seeking him. And I love that little line because it's just one of the simplest and yet deepest ways that we can be countercultural. How we can do something that looks different from what everyone around us is doing and shows them that there is a different way to live. You know, think about your own life, the busyness of it. Think about, especially pre COVID, how every night it seemed like could be scheduled with something going on. Every weekend was full of events, of parties, of get-togethers. Every day, we went to the office and we worked ourselves to the bone. And quarantine has, has not been all bad from the perspective that it has forced us to slow down sometimes. Think of all the ways that people can get a hold of you. Think of all the people who might make demands on your time. Spouses, kids, bosses, teachers, parents, pets. Who knows who else wants or needs something from you. And now multiply that all by a thousand and you start to get an idea of what it's like to be Jesus. Wherever he went, people were crowding around him. People were following him. People were pursuing him. People were delivering their prayer requests for their afflicted loved ones. But Jesus was not flustered. Busy and sought after as he always is, he has actually set aside time right in the middle of everyone else's demands on him to disconnect from the world and to reconnect with his father. Make no mistake, while he is praying in that deserted place that morning, the people of Capernaum are still suffering. They're still hurting. They're, they're still broken. They are still in need of him. 
And if Jesus wanted to, he could get up earlier and he could see more patients. He could probably stay up round the clock and never see the end of them. Yet his relationship with God is such a priority that he sets aside time to do this. He chooses to make time for God away from all of his pressing obligations because he knows that he can't offer wholeness to anyone else if he doesn't have it himself. Jesus' actions demonstrate to you and to me that we always have time to spend time with God. We are never too busy for God. And when we feel like we are, then maybe it's more important than ever to make time. Because the world will always be there with all of its problems. We just won't be equipped to do anything about them if we aren't drawing on the strength of the Lord. Now finally, once Jesus has had his prayer retreat, what does he do? He says to his shocked disciples, okay, pack it up, it's time to go, we're moving on. And Jesus is on the move once again. He just won't stay put. Like I said earlier, there is an urgency to his story that Mark's gospel really emphasizes. Everything happens so fast. People are always struggling to keep up, and events are over before you know it. Jesus has moved on to the next thing. Again, when you get in the car with Jesus, you just have to hold on tight for the ride. But at the same time, you have to let go. You have to let go. You can't be a backseat driver. You cannot keep Jesus' attention focused on you and your problems. Jesus is the one at the wheel. Jesus is the one setting the agenda. Jesus is the one who is in charge, and we are the ones who have to follow where he goes. You know, so often we think we know what's best for Jesus. We know what he ought to be most concerned about. And most of the time, Jesus' top priority, as we would, would uh, establish it, looks suspiciously like us, doesn't it? When his disciples come looking for him that morning, and they tell him his village is crying out for, for help, you know, what are they really saying? They're saying, Jesus, stay here a little longer. Stay in our hometown. Stay in our comfort zone. Stay here among the people and the places we know best and care most about. But Jesus says, look, I'm sorry. I can't stay. There is a whole world out there that needs to know what we know, that needs to hear God's message. We have to let Jesus drive. We have to let Jesus drive. We want too much to be in control and to tell Jesus what to do. We assume Jesus is really just here for us to attend to our issues. We need to be willing to let go of Jesus and recognize there are others out there who need him too. If we are the 99 faithful who stayed in the pen, then we need to let Jesus go out in search of those who are lost. We're not going to be able to stop him. And if we want that badly to be with him, then maybe the best thing for us to do would be to leave the pen as well. Follow him out into the world and take care of those who he loves and seeks and serves. Jesus is not going to stay put. He is not going to slow down. So let's stop asking him to get comfortable in here with us where it's warm and cozy. And let's learn to follow Jesus wherever he wants to take us, like true disciples. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us turn to God in prayer now. Lord, we know that it is hard to keep up with you. We know that you have so much to do in this world. You have so much to heal, so much brokenness to attend to. And we're only a small part of that. God, we are broken. We are hurting. We are in need of your attention and your healing. And we pray 
that you will be present with us, that you will help us, oh God, to, to address those hurts within our lives in productive ways. But God, once we are on the path to healing, help us not to just be content sitting there receiving from you. Help us to have a, a passion and a fire and an energy that drives us to get up, to receive the new life you give us, and to move into lives of service. Help us, O oh God, to respond to the healing that you bring us by going out and seeking others who need that healing. Help us to, to think about those in our lives who are struggling, who are hurt, who are lost, who are, who are mentally, physically, or otherwise at the end of their ropes. And God, help us to bring them to your doorstep. God, when we look around at the world, we see people who are people who are addicted. We see people who are caught up in in temptations and in and in bad decisions. We see people who are living their lives for the sake of profit, the pursuit of wealth. We are see people who are living their lives for the pursuit of all sorts of things that are not you. God, help us sometimes. That has been us as well. But Lord, turn us away from all those things that, that hold our attention so fiercely. Turn us away from those things that keep us busy. Turn us away from that sense of self-importance that says we have to stay busy in order for people to care about us and to, to believe that we're worthy and worthwhile. Turn us away from all of that, God, and turn us back toward you. Teach us that it is not just okay, but necessary for us to slow down and to give our time back to you to reprioritize our relationship with you so that we might understand more fully and more deeply who you are and who you're calling us to be. God, help us to get more comfortable with, with being quiet and being still. God, for all those who are close to us, for all those who are suffering in ways that we can't understand or even imagine, we pray. We lift them up before you this day, and we trust that you will hear the prayers we raise in speech and in silence now. God, we thank you that you are, as always, in our midst, and you are hearing your people as we pray. Help us to understand the answers that you give. Help us to have patience, to hear and respond. Help us to follow you and go with you wherever you might call us to serve. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, uh, we come to a time of offering, and even though we are not passing the plate uh, in, these, in this time as we normally would, uh, it is still a great time for us to think about what we have to give to God. I am so thankful for those who are faithfully uh, mailing in checks or going online or, or finding other ways to continue to contribute to the work of God's church. Uh, and I, I do encourage you to keep on doing that. It is so important. Um, but during this time, let us focus on what we have to offer to God.
God, for all your many blessings, we give you thanks. We ask you to use the gifts of our time, our talent, our treasure, in order to build your kingdom in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, friends, we come to the Lord's table, and we are invited to meet the Lord here. This is the table that Jesus has prepared for the people who are hungry and thirsty, the people who desire to know him better. As we come to this table, let us be reassured that we are here at his invitation. This isn't my table. This isn't St. Andrew's table. Wherever and whenever you are watching this, you are welcome at God's table because he has invited you. Let us give thanks to God. Lord, we know that you have prepared this table for us. You have prepared the bread and the cup. You have prepared the body and the blood. And you have invited us to meet you here because you know what we need. Not because of what we've done, not because of who we are, not because of anything in us that makes us worthy or deserving of your love, but because you choose to love us, because you choose to take care of us. So God, help us receive these gifts knowing that your love is a willful love, that it will not run out, it will not go dry, it will not turn, it will not falter. No matter what we do, who we are, where we go, your love will pursue us. Help us as we share in your body and blood today to understand a little bit better what that love means for us and what that love asks of us in response. God, teach us to know the, the lives of service and sacrifice that your son did so that others might also know the truth, might hear the good news, might experience it through us. We pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may remain seated for our uh, congregational communion hymn.
friends, Scripture tells us that when Jesus was at table with his disciples on the night of his arrest, he took bread like this and blessed it and broke it and shared it with them, telling them, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That same night after they'd eaten, he took the cup. Pouring it out, he told them, this cup represents the new covenant which is sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the Lord until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And at this time, we will join together in God's feast. You can go ahead and remove the first seal and take the wafer, and we will partake together the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Now, if you peel back the second layer, the cup of salvation. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, you are good to us. You provide for our every need. You take care of us in ways that we are not even aware of and do not fully understand. Help us, oh God, to become more alert, more aware. Help us to recognize your faithfulness to us. And help us to turn back to a needy world full of your goodness, full of your grace, full of your truth, nourished by your spirit. Help us to turn back to that needy world and extend to them the same grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise for our closing hymn.
people of God, know that God is with you. God is actually in the driver's seat, and we are not going to be backseat drivers. We are going to be faithful followers, trusting in where he's taking us, knowing that it is a good place, but it is possibly a challenging place, or at least the journey to get there might take more out of us than we expected. Let us trust in him. Let us have faith in him. Let us know that he is in control. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you and be gracious to you and give you peace. And all God's people say, Hallelujah. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.